right. Hello, everyone. I see folks are still connecting to audio. Looks like you're mostly connected. So I will uh, start a little intro here as I wait for everyone to get connected. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today for the research brown bag, Sylvia Gwendelman. Um, she'll be speaking about maternal fetal medicine and um, specifically use of telehealth uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and for those of you who uh, don't know Sylvia, she's uh, a professor emerita here at the School of Public Health and founded and is currently an advisory committee chair for the Wallace Center um, for Mater Maternal Child and Adolescent Health. Um, and so we look forward to hearing about this work. Thank you, Sylvia. Well, thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know this is a busy time of year, busy schedules, so I'm delighted to be able to share our work with you. Um, our work on telehealth um, involves a collaboration between the Wallace Center, um, myself and another student who's now working at UCSF, Grace Kruger, as well as um, a Stanford School of Medicine team, Dr. Suar Worthy, who is a, an assistant clinical professor in OB. She's currently scrubbing and therefore couldn't make it today. Um, she's about to see a high-risk patient, as well as Dr. Paula Treppmann, um, who um, I hope is here and I can introduce you to her today. Um, and um, I guess she's not here yet. And Dr. Giovanna Cruz, an epidemiologist and also alumni of our school. Um, so very briefly, this project was sponsored, partly funded, uh, co-sponsored by the Wallace Center. And we conduct actionable research in innovation and technology to advance maternal and child health. Um, and reduce inequities in communities. We also train future leaders. So I hope that some of the students are here today to understand a little bit about the work that we're doing. One of the projects that we're really interested in has to do with integrating technology into care, specifically right now into prenatal and postnatal care. Uh, from the standpoint of telehealth. Uh, we're interested in how telehealth uh, from both the patient and provider perspective can influence uh, maternal and infant health outcomes um, and use of care. So that's basically why um, we did this project. And um, I'd like to share with you um, more about that, but a little background perhaps first to give you a sense of telehealth in maternity care. And let's start with the pandemic since that's what's ubiquitously affecting us all. And what we see is that the pandemic has really disrupted uh, traditional prenatal care models. Prenatal care in this country is very um, intensive. It requires at least 12 to 14 visits for a low risk um, birth. And um, it's also been very much focused on in-person care. Um, but during the pandemic, telehealth has been increasingly used because it helps to ensure safe and continuous care. And safety is something that we cannot downplay for pregnant women, given that COVID can be risky uh, during pregnancy. As a matter of fact, from data, CDC data as of 1017 of this year, we see that pre pregnant women um, have been reported to have um, both cases, about 23,000 have been hospitalized. There's been 200 deaths. So COVID cannot be minimized. Um, there are other advantages to telehealth as well. It can be extended to maternity care deserts, for instance, and support isolated providers. Again, this is a very important issue because 
for instance, according to the um, National Association of Nurse Midwives, they did a study in 2018 and amazingly found that 46% of counties in the US lack an OB uh, in that county. So um, maybe the provision of telehealth for rural areas is really an important consideration. Telehealth has also been shown to improve continuity of care with patients who have difficulty making appointments. There's been quite a, a bit of, um, uh, of um, interest in how telehealth can reduce no-shows among many different kinds of patients. And furthermore, patients like telehealth because it is convenient. It reduces transportation costs, childcare costs, time away from work. But on the other hand, many patients mentioned that they dislike the lack of human interaction involved in telehealth. So is telehealth here to stay? Can it create better access? Well, to really sort of answer these questions, we need to understand the extent of use by both providers and consumers, identify what are the key determinants of use of telehealth, assess satisfaction with its use, as well as desire for future use. We will try and answer some of these questions today, but before that, let me just quickly jump into a few nomenclature issues. Telehealth and telemedicine. These are terms that have been used interchangeably. Telemedicine refers to the actual clinical encounter for diagnosis and treatment between patient and healthcare provider in different locations. Telehealth, on the other hand, includes telemedicine as well as other technologies for preventative educational and health-related administrative activities. In our study, we're using the broader definition of telehealth. And please note that telehealth can be delivered in different modalities, so it's quite comprehensive. We're talking here of text messaging, electronic patient portals, smartphone apps that connect with healthcare teams, remote patient monitoring, uh, to read, let's say, blood pressure or glucose, remote reading of ultrasound images, as well as virtual visits via audio or live video. And note that many public and private insurance plans require the use of video conferencing for telehealth services. So we use live video as the focus for this study. From a provider perspective, quickly, what is known? Well, again, COVID has hastened the transition to telehealth among OBGYNs. One Kaiser Family Foundation study showed that by June 2020, 84% of obstetricians were using telehealth, a jump from 16% pre-pandemic. We also know that maternal fetal medicine providers, those who see high risk um, pregnancies, utilize more telehealth than other OB care providers. In fact, they've been using ultrasound, remote ultrasound readings and interpretation for quite a, lo a long time now. Um, other studies note higher use of telehealth among female physicians, younger ones, those that have used um, telehealth pre-pandemic tend to use it more, and physicians located in urban locations in the Northeast and West, and in states that have offered Medicaid expansion. At the same time, there are several barriers that counteract uh, or deter the use of telehealth. And here I can identify a few, such as payer policies, a lack of payer parity between face-to-face -face and telehealth, um, lots of technical and connectivity challenges, licensing issues such that, for instance, 
if a physician practices in a state other than uh, where the, re uh, the patient resides, they might not be able to do so. Insufficient provider buy-in uh, to use telehealth and perceived patient characteristics that might undermine access to telehealth. So there are many um, enablers and deterrents of use, it seems. But when you do a review of the literature, as our study did, one thing that really um, struck us was the lack of multivariate studies to really understand the drivers of telehealth among obstetric providers. So our study aim was to identify um, predisposing and enabling factors associated with telehealth use among maternal fetal medicine clinicians as of March 11, 2020. Why March 11? Because that was the day that WHO formally declared it as a, a pandemic. Now we used um, we used several um, variables uh, from a survey uh, that we conducted, and I wanted to show you our uh, framework here. Um, we conceptualized, and to the right you see what our outcomes are. We conceptualized two outcomes. Uh, namely use of any live video visit during the pandemic. And this was a categorical variable, yes or no. And then among users, the amount of maximum use of live video visits used during the start uh, from as of the start of the pandemic. And we categorize that as you will see into high versus low use. And we were trying to determine whether there were predisposing and enabling factors that were associated with each of these two outcomes. Among the predisposing factors, we have provider demographics such as age, gender, years of OB practice, and several practice setting characteristics like is the practice located in an urban, suburban, or rural area, whether the provider provided comprehensive prenatal care or inpatient care, whether the type of practice was a university-based, corporate, um, government, or community clinic practice, or maybe uh, a provider was practicing in multi-practice settings. We looked at census region of that practice and whether it was in a Medicaid expansion state. We also looked at enabling factors, meaning whether telehealth use in different modalities shown here were used prior to the pandemic. And we looked at the barriers of care, such as structural barriers like regulations, training and provider resistance, institutional lack of support, software or hardware usability barriers, setup costs or reimbursement barriers. And we finally looked at what providers perceived to be patient barriers, such as whether the the person pre prefers a face-to-face -face visit, the patient had privacy concerns or access to internet net and data plans. Finally, we also looked at among the users, the extent of satisfaction with telehealth use and whether they would use it in the future. So for the survey methods, I wanted my um, colleague, um, Paula Trepman uh, to see if she can present to you what we did. Um, I wonder if uh, she is here today. Again, obstetricians are sometimes unreliable because of their uh, heavy workload. Um, I Can anyone tell me whether I don't see her name. Okay, so I will tell you more about the survey myself. So um, both Paula and Sana at Stanford 
were, um, are very involved with the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And together they launched this survey sponsored by the society um, in December of last year. It was an online national survey that they sent to all the active members of the society. And um, although the response rate was low at 16%, this is not unusual these days. For this survey, which um, we analyzed uh, at the Wallace Center, we only took those clinicians who were providing direct patient care and who had complete data on the two outcomes that I mentioned. So our analytic sample consisted of 373 clinicians. To the right, you can see the survey topics that were covered. Um, and um, about the survey, the initial invitation was sent in early December of 2020. And um, there was another reminder sent about a week later. And then the online survey was posted to that um, clinician's website. The participants gave informed consent when they initiated the survey, which consisted of 30 questions and took on average 12 minutes to complete. This um, survey was presented to the Stanford University's uh, IRB office, and um, we were exempt from human subjects review after that. A quick uh, look our, at our data analytic plan before I move to the findings. We started out with the univariate um, analysis, generating, you know, uh, percentages, frequencies, um, means, uh, standard errors. Then we moved to bivariate analysis to look at the association between each one of the independent uh, variables shown in our. Um, framework, conceptual framework, and the two outcomes, and then proceeded to do logistic regression, estimating odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals. And for that, again, we followed our conceptual model where we ran simultaneous regression models that included combinations of the significant predisposing and enabling variables and please note also that we were guided by the AIC criterion to help us select the best fitting model. A very quick overview here of our sample. Um, as you can see, we have a wide distribution of age. Uh, on average, the clinicians were 49 years old, 65% um, were females, and on average, they have practiced uh, 17 years um, in OB. In um, terms of practice location, uh, to the left, you can see 31% were practicing in uh, the South, another 28% in the West. 65% uh, were located in urban areas, but we got 14% of clinicians in rural areas. Um, type of practice setting was predominantly university setting, uh, followed by community and government setting. But again, 13% of the responders were practicing in multiple settings. So again, quite a bit of diversity there. And here it comes to our outcomes. As you can see, 88% of the respondents said that they had used live video visits during uh, this period of the pandemic, whereas 12% said they had not. Um, and among the users, 56% uh, used it in no more than 25% of all their encounters or visits with patients, whereas 44% we consider to be higher users um, if they at least um, had a share of 26% or, or more of the uh, total visits. Now, the next slide um, shows you the um, 
predisposing factors in our unadjusted models. Um, and you can see here that uh, those clinicians that provided comprehensive prenatal care and practiced in settings where inpatient care was provided were about have three times the odds of um, actually engaging in any telehealth use, whereas those um, practicing in multiple practice settings um, had a lower um, likelihood of, of use compared to those providers in university settings. The next, um, oops, the next slide shows you the enabling factors and you can see that again, um, having used um, telehealth prior to the pandemic in different modalities, any remote patient visit or patient portals to communicate with the patient on, or ultrasound reading remotely was associated anywhere between two and a half to four times uh, the odds of, of using telehealth video uh, engagement. And barriers um, detected around software hardware usability, reimbursement issues, and patient access were other uh, barriers that were associated with, um, with use. This is probably a very hard slide for you to read. All I want to show here is that we ran two regression models. Model one in that first uh, column or in the middle column here in the right shows you in red what are the variables that remained associated with, our, uh, with tele any telehealth video use um, after controlling for all the other variables um, that were either um, pre, uh, predisposing or enabling factors um, in the model. And um, model two refers to further doing sensitivity analysis to force in variables such as years of obstetric practice, um, the uh, urbanicity and the practice location. And um, what you can see, excuse me, um, is that uh, there are important variables here that can be summarized in this next slide. Of the variables in our model, the type of practice set setting, any communication using an online patient portal pre-pandemic, identification of software or hardware usability barriers and perceiving patient access barriers were associated with use of video visits in our multivariate models. So what do, do drivers of any live video use mean? Well, when we say practice setting was associated with any use, we can begin to unravel that maybe university settings uh, are more conducive to the use of um, telehealth. They have the HIT capabilities and also use electronic medical records to deliver telehealth. Um, whereas government practices, for instance, have computer firewalls. So it makes it more difficult for people in those practices to deliver care. Community clinics, on the other hand, really lag in offering live video telehealth. They're, at least from our understanding of many clinics in California, they're using mainly phone um, telehealth via audio or phone. The second variables have to do with pre-pandemic use of patient portals. Um, and that, again, may indicate more advanced functioning of the electronic health records, such as EPIC, for instance, which is uh, widely used in university-based settings. And um, the fact that telehealth platforms that are used 
can integrate with the electronic medical records so that you can reduce the concerns about whether um, telehealth will work once you're trying to communicate with the patients. We also know that previous use of telehealth enhances future use. So there's no wonder that the pre-pandemic use of patient portal was a driver of use during the pandemic. The third um, variable had to do with hardware, software usability issues. And here again, we see lots of connectivity issues, the limited video capability that some hospital computers have, um, and all the challenges of integrating telehealth technology into clinical work for, uh, workflows, such as rooming. How are you going to schedule the patients and allocate them into different uh, rooms when you're conducting telehealth. And finally, there are lots of clinicians um, who were perceiving um, patient barriers. And what we see is the more they use it, the more providers use it, the more they detect that patients having lack of Wi-Fi signals or poor cell phone capability or low digital literacy or lack of HIPAA compliant platforms were all sort of connected to this perception of patient barriers. Now let's turn to any use, I mean, the amount of use among those uh, who were using live video. And um, here you can see again that in our um, unadjusted regression models, the type of practice setting um, was important so that university settings, again, have higher um, number of uh, clinicians who use more telehealth. So in, in relation to university-based uh, practitioners, community and government, as well as clinicians practicing in multiple practice settings were uh, less likely to have high use of these live videos. Um, high use of videos as opposed to low use was also associated with the patient portals um, and having used um, ultrasound imaging remotely before the pandemic, as well as uh, several uh, more structural barriers, such as um, seeing barriers for training providers and staff, um, reimbursement, and patient access. And what it tells you here is that high users of telehealth tend to see more of these barriers compared to low users. And Again, uh, in our multivariate models, which followed the same sequence as for any use, you can see that these are the variables that remain important. The ones in the red uh, highlighted boxes are the ones that are mostly associated with amount of use of live video. Uh, practice location, any remote ultrasound imaging, done prior to pan the pandemic and a perception of patient access barriers. Now, in terms of the high users, we can see that there's a lot of satisfaction and ample interest in using it in the future. Namely, you can see that 63% of clinicians rated services through telehealth as excellent. 84% thought it was a positive thing for the clinic, and 94% said they wanted to use it once the pandemic is lifted or eased. Um, here in this uh, table, you can see the differences in satisfaction and desire to use in the future between uh, um, those who were low users and high users. And what you can see is that high users, of course, were more satisfied with it uh, and also would like to use it in the future. But what's interesting is if you read the last row, 
it says that 92% even of the low users are interested in using it in the future compa compared to 99% among the high users. Here's a quote from one of our study respondents who says, we could help more people and do it safer with telehealth. Um, and as you read it, you can see that this provider is frustrated with the fact that the senior partner does not want to use telehealth and therefore they have to drive a long ways in multiple directions uh, when in fact they could be using telehealth much more efficiently. In conclusion, what are some of the take home messages that I would really like you to keep? is that there's widespread telehealth use by maternal fetal medicine clinicians, but they use it selectively in only about one in four visits for their high-risk patients. And that's partly because visits require oftentimes ultrasounds that are not amenable to telehealth. Uh, second, that there are many factors at the health level of the healthcare institution and community patient level that affect use. Technical barriers and patient uh, digital access barriers are important deterrents of use. Um, and uh, the, those need a lot of improvement. Um, Practice setting is an important driver of telehealth use and that providers in general have positive attitudes and would like to use it more um, in the future. And this is very important, I think, because that attitude is what potentially could improve access to care and work to eliminate health disparities in maternity care. There are lots of strengths and limitations to our study, of which today's are listed here. Um, we are um, happy that we got lots of geographic diversity and diversity in clinical practice settings. We employed a rich array of covariates in our models, but of course there were limitations, uh, such as the response rate, which was low and it could contribute to sampling bias. Uh, we don't know whether the respondents were applying telehealth to high risk or low risk patients when they were thinking about the answers for this survey. Uh, we don't have really the patient perspective that is something we want to work on in the future for other studies. We also captured only one moment in time, so longitudinal studies with larger samples are really needed. But there are policy implications from our study. Um, I think it'll require advocacy efforts by obstetricians at the state and national levels to address technical barriers and equitable access and use of telehealth. And the technological issues will, be, ha will have to be addressed before the patient providers encounters happen. There's also important policy implications moving forward, which is do we, um, can we think of a hybrid model of prenatal care moving forward? Um, I think that this study raises a lot of questions about um, the current prenatal healthcare delivery model. Um, perhaps some prenatal appointments could be prioritized as virtual depending not only on clinical criteria, but also on patient preferences. So more research is going to be required to help us uh, guide providers on when and how to implement telehealth along the maternal newborn healthcare continuum. And uh, this research could also inform how to achieve equitable access. As I said before, the US recommends 12 to 14 prenatal care visits for low-risk women. In fact, much more than what the World Health Organization at eight visits recommends. And we know from several studies that fewer visits don't lead to more complications or adverse outcomes. 
And so some providers are beginning to experiment with mixed models of prenatal care. In fact, the Mayo Clinic is the leader in this effort. But as you can see here, uh, traditional prenatal care, meaning 12 visits, OB NEST, which was the, um, the clinical trial done at Mayo, which introduced uh, virtual visits by, a nurse, uh, by nurses uh, online. And these are the green dots that you see where and when it was introduced. It still does not eliminate the amount of prenatal visits. Plus this clinical trial was done with more educated middle-class women. So what happens with women who are coming from disadvantaged communities? These are issues that we need to test as well as telehealth could be perhaps a game changer for postpartum visits. Uh, in California, we have new laws that extend the postpartum period to 12 months. And so could we offer some telehealth care continuously to women in the postpartum, not only at six weeks, but over the 12 months are all issues that we need to ponder and think about how we could test uh, in further studies. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for that great presentation. So really interesting data. Uh, if people want to either put questions in the chat or you can put your video on and, and ask questions um, directly, that would be great. Hi, Sylvia. Hi. It's just fall. Uh, congratulations uh, on all this work. I've seen some of this before, but it's um, I learned some new things today. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I have a whole handful of questions. I'll send you some offline. Um, okay. One of them uh, is related to um, the patient side of this. And I, I know you pointed it out as a, a limitation of the study. It's just what the study was, right? That it focused on providers. Right. But, um, you know, if you were to do a complementary study to kind of examine some of the same issues from the patient perspective, and you know, you had the magic, the magic wand that could let you engage some of the very patients, the very mothers um, that these providers um, were caring for, what uh, what would that look like? What would you want to know to sort of maybe complete the picture? Well, um, I would certainly like to know whether um, what the providers are telling us are their perceived, uh, uh, their perceptions jive with what the patients say. Um, I would want to begin there. Um, it um, seems that the uh, clinicians are detecting all these digital access barriers, uh, but then when you examine the literature, some studies say that that's a real problem, but there was a study done at UCSF that actually created a, a sort of a mock uh, telehealth situation and interviewed safety net patients and they were saying that, in fact, they would uh, very much like to have telehealth video encounters with their prenatal care providers. So I think that uh, what, that's one example of why we cannot really um, know or, or, or assume that what the providers perceive are the same things that the patient perceives. And I'd like to know that. Um, but I would also like to know from the patient, how do patients do their cost benefit analysis? Do they really um, think that telehealth is useful, but maybe not a yes or no in some occasions more than others? So I'd like to know um, when would a face-to-face -face visit 
be satisfactory to the patient versus when would a telehealth video be good enough? I know from many patients that I have interviewed that oftentimes 12 visits over a prenatal um, nine month period becomes very tedious. And oftentimes it's just to do some measurements that could be easily done with good digital resources. So the question is, um, how could that be done? And the other question for you would be knowing um, how do these different issues vary by characteristics of the patient? Because uh, we need to be aware that one size doesn't fit all. Absolutely, thanks, Sylvia. I look forward to your other questions uh, later, just Bob. I'll send them to you this afternoon. And if Perfect. nobody else asks questions, I'll, I'll use up the time. Sounds good. Thanks, other questions? Don't be shy, I'm here to answer any questions you, you want to the best of my abilities. I'm just going to ask you another one then, Sylvia. Well, maybe somebody else comes up with a question. Oh, there's one in the chat. Now, Garen says no questions per se, but wanted to say thank you for the great presentation. So go ahead, Jasper. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, that last quote that you shared was really interesting because it, it related to maybe another barrier around decision-making in smaller organizations, whether it's a community clinic or a, um, like an individual practice. We have a few of those still, I think, out in the world. Um, you know, looking at the outcomes of this research, what uh, advice would you provide to say that junior partner at that, um, at that specific practice or, CEO or CMO at a community clinic. So not just generalized advice, but based on what, what you've seen come out of this research, uh, somebody who, who wants to do this for their organization, not simply in the role as a ob guy, but as a role in the role as a, uh, an administrator, what, um, what advice would you provide to them to, to sort of start to enact this? Well, I think that, um, again, there are different levels of, um, of getting involved in this, right? One is the idea of, I'm hoping that these survey results will be published and disseminated by the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine um, so that... Um, OB, GYNs be, begin to be more um, stronger advocates and use this material to do so. Because I think that, um, again, there's, there needs to be work with, um, at the policy level, for instance, how can you make um, electronic medical records be more compatible with um, different um, health systems and, and hospitals uh, that provide this service? Um, how can you make them user friendlier and simpler so that people can really use it? I would tell them, try and connect with um, some uh, advocates uh, like nonprofit organizations like um, the um, CCI, the, 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 what is it, care uh, oh, accelerator yep. that they have in California to train community level clinics uh, and uh, to see how they can advance from um, audio video to live video and begin to solve together uh, as a community of clinics, for instance, some of the technical issues that come up. Um, but I would also say to this provider, uh, see what you can do to drum up interest among your fellow practitioners and, and figure out 
how you can um, move from video to, to audio uh, in ways that are gonna be compatible with what you can offer and try to test it during the pandemic because um, at this time regulations are more relaxed and it is quite possible that once the pandemic is lifted, um, many of the regulations around HIPAA and um, licensing and so forth uh, or reimbursement might not be there anymore. So try and see how far you can get. And then if you think it's really a good thing, advocate for relaxation or keeping the regulations at a level that is manageable for providers and consumers. Thanks, Sylvia. I think Lindsay's got a question for you too. Hi, Sylvia. Um, thank you for the presentation. I was really interested in um, your discussion at the very end about how this kind of technology could be used for postpartum issues because that's an area where um, scheduling and transportation are particularly difficult with a newborn. And there's widespread um, views that the current postpartum care structure as it is, is inadequate, especially for issues that come up um, really urgently and very emergently like uh, you know, postpartum mental um, health issues. So I was curious if you had projects in the works to look at this, or um, if you knew of any organizations that were looking into ways to catalyze on the, the current climate with um, the technology use um, in the postpartum setting. Um, not yet, but it's a plan, Lindsay, and All right. I hope, <laughs> I hope uh, you can help me with that in the future. I, I want partners for that, and anybody else in this audience that is interested, um, I welcome that you contact me about that. Well, I look forward to talking to you more about that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And um, one other question came in from Liz Crane. She's having some audio issues, issues, but she said we're seeing some of these issues in an evaluation of a rural maternity network program. Very strong demand among patients for telehealth care, especially for women who live two to four hours away from the nearest provider. That jives with all the uh, work uh, or evidence that I have read, as well as from our respondents, as you could see from the uh, quote that, that I shared with you. So thank you, yeah. Yes, I think I've got my audio working now. And one thing that was interesting about this was among one of the program awardees for this project, there wasn't initially a plan to introduce a telehealth MFM provider, but a mother's council revealed that that was a top priority for many of the women in the service area. And they were talking extremely long, mountainous, sketchy weather drives for these prenatal appointments. And they couldn't do it anymore. And the network is now experimenting with different types of telehealth, including uh, home telehealth kits, messaging, synchronous visits, asynchronous visits, really the full suite. So we're evaluating it to see how things go. Oh, that's great. Uh, that's wonderful. I think that um, you remind me too that this is almost like the tip of the iceberg and we should be looking at the other modalities as well to see what the provider's perceptions um, were around some of these other ones that we didn't touch on today. So yes, thank you. Important issues. Great, well, we're at time, but thank you very, very much for your presentation today. We really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining today and um, hope you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you.